Good evening. I'm calling this meeting to order. The time is 5.30 p.m. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code, Chapter 551, this meeting is officially open with the quorum present. I will turn it over to Dr. Ramsey for our technology presentation. Thank you this evening. We're very excited to hear from our Chief Innovation Officer, or Chief of Technology, Ramesh Krishnamurthy, who is going to provide us an update on technology. I'm waiting for the deck. Great. Uh, good evening, Dr. Rodriguez, board members, Dr. Ramsey, and everyone here and online. Uh, my name is Ramesh Krishnamurthy. I'm the technology leader for Fort Worth ISG. Uh, it's been four months since I joined the organization, and I'm really eager to uh, provide uh, some reports on good progress. The It's not working. Oh, technology. That. Sorry. <laughs> uh, the the agenda is to kind of like recap uh, the independent audit and the recommendations uh, resulting from the independent audit, and uh, basically the the result has been the optimized organization structure, and and finally I would like to talk about uh, the accomplishments and the future opportunities. Uh, to to basically recap, uh, we. We performed an in-depth analysis with our independent consulting, Gibson, uh, Gibson Consulting, the independent partners. Uh, they performed an in-depth review of our people, processes, and platforms. Uh, apart from discussing within technology, they also kind of like worked with campus leaders. Uh, they also uh, met with parents. They also met with district and technology leaders. Uh, this result in identifying the SWOT analysis and our strengths, our students are our biggest strengths. Uh, and we play a pivotal role uh, in shaping students' life. Uh, a positive school experience can inspire lifelong learning and personal growth. In addition to students, our people, our staff, people and talent within our staff are our biggest strengths. Our role as leaders is to self-evaluate as an individual and also as a team. And this leads to the weakness and, and opportunities. Uh, to positively impact student outcomes, we need to be collaborative and make integrated decisions. Uh, we also need to implement technology efficiently, resulting in seamless uh, customer support. In addition, like I've talked, I've talked about this internally, uh, we need to use data to make objective decisions uh, to ensure that we provide the best infrastructure uh, for our campus to be successful. It is extremely critical to have uh, the ability to scale people, process, and platforms. We need to be agile. We need to be dynamic uh, to make integrated decisions to to prioritize the needs of the campus. And, and finally, the threats. Uh, our threats to success is basically end-user training. Uh, we need to make sure that we provide end-user training to both campus as well as district staff uh, to ensure that our teachers can concentrate to elevate the teaching experience, which is extremely important. And also, our asset management is, is asset management plan is a, is a threat to successfully comply with all guidelines. The result of the audit was 24 recommendations, and some of the recommendations, you see it on the right. Uh, but the main thing is it all came, came, came together, where our district leadership uh, had some concerns with technology. That triggered an independent audit. And the independent auditors came in, acknowledged the issue, and provided recommendations. And then I was onboarded and, and was aligned with the direction of the audit. So with the information and validation from three sources, it kind of like triangulated in terms of like where we are going as an organization. And it also kind of like helped us with the data that what we are doing from a organization structure and the process that we are kind of like taking the right direction. And that's what the results of the independent audit is in association with me getting onboarded. 
Before before I discuss about the organization structure, I would kind of like quickly uh, review my core principles. What does customer obsession mean? Uh, in my definition, it's shifting left. And what I mean by shifting left is you've got to understand your customers. Without understanding your customers, you cannot kind of like define a strategy from a technology standpoint. And in this case, the customers are basically campus, teachers, and students. It's very, very important. We've got to clearly understand in terms of like how schools operate. Uh, the second thing is like it's extremely important to me and us uh, to simplify our processes, simplify our platforms, to make it end user uh, efficient. I think that's very, very important. The third thing is like what we do daily is all about professional relationship. We've got to earn our trust in order to kind of like work together as a team and deliver results. And finally, it's like, it's simple, two words, we've got to deliver, we've got to deliver results. Uh, to kind of like add to this, like sticking to a process is extremely essential in any field that demands excellence. If you focus on the process and trust in, our, trust in your abilities, results are automatically going to follow. So I think that's kind of like an addition to my core principles. Uh, as far as the new organization structure is concerned, it's broken down into three parts. Part number one, it's basically technology operations. What I call it as uh, keep the lights on, run the business, ensuring that what we are doing on a day-to-day -day basis uh, to, to basically provide the best platform, best infrastructure for our students and teachers to be successful. The second team, what I call it as the technology strategy, and in my word is basically grow the business. We've got to modernize our applications, we've got to modernize our tools, and this is where this team is going to kind of like help uh, running the business to ensure that as we are running the business, we also kind of like modernize our applications and tools to ensure that we are better prepared for our future. And the third big part is basically security. Security is not a technology only function, security is a district wide function. So it's extremely critical for us, it's extremely critical for me that we secure our perimeter and we secure our infrastructure. So that's kind of like the foundation from organization structure standpoint. The next slide is, this is basically a detailed organization structure. This kind of like goes back to Gibson's recommendation, we work very, very closely with our independent auditors to ensure that the recommendations were implemented. Uh, this is where we implemented a flatline structure, significantly improved direct customer support, and our, our goal is to kind of like be proactive with our business operations. As part of the organization structure, uh, we recommended two executive directors uh, for, for basically two candidates for our open executive directors. We would highly appreciate if the board can review and approve. Now is basically the fun part. Uh, here are some recent achievements as far as technology as an organization is concerned. The first thing is security. Uh, we recently implemented in January, multi-factor authentication for all staff accounts. That's extremely important to, to secure our accounts. Uh, we did not implement this feature for students to minimize the impact. This has been only implemented from a staff standpoint. We are working with our vendors to, and also I'm also working with my peers in the rest of the school districts, how to kind of like secure our student accounts uh, without implementing the multi-factor authentication because we want to ensure that uh, the teachers are efficient from a classroom standpoint. The second part is uh, we modernized our firewalls to secure the perimeter of the structure. In simple terms, firewall is basically a network security device that monitors and filters incoming and outgoing traffic. That's, that's all it does, so we are kind of like modernized to ensure that we are protecting our perimeter. In, in our previous slides, uh, we discussed about organization structure. Uh, we reduced operating expenses and increased our direct customer support. Uh, the third bullet, this sounds rudimentary. However, I would like to call out that we wrote job descriptions for each and every technology position. This was a significant effort, but I think this is extremely important for our people. 
And finally, uh, I'm excited about this. Uh, we reviewed at all of our contracts and optimized our services. That basically resulted in 1.6 million savings as far as this school year is concerned. And I'm going to be talking about budget in every slide because this is extremely important to me in terms of how we optimize and continue to reevaluate how we spend our funds. So the next slide, we are not stopping here. We are going to continue our march to modernize and be more efficient. Uh, we are working uh, to define a multi-year strategy for all devices, for students, teachers, and staffs. When I talk about devices, it can be laptops, desktops. Uh, you're talking about like audio-visual interactive board and also printers, scanners, and copiers. So we're kind of like defining a clear multi-year strategy. We are currently deploying private LTE uh, to students that do not have access to internet at home. Uh, this has been kind of like one of our top accomplishments in the past four months. This directly impact our students. Pilot is in progress, and, and I'm, I'm extremely excited about this project because it's directly and positively impacting our students. Uh, the third thing is like I discussed uh, earlier regarding security and we worked with our internal audit office to agree on a framework. We are gonna be following the NEST framework to ensure that we identify gaps within our security system and also remediate as far as the gaps are concerned. And as I said in my last slide, we are going to continue to look at budget. Like we are going to look at our budget line item after line item to ensure that as we are going into 24, 25, 25, 26, we know exactly what we are asking and we have a good return on investment. And finally, we are also kind of like working with our communication partners, uh, communication team, we launched TechBite. Uh, which is part of like one Fort Worth ISD bulletin. And like we have a small section over there. We are going to continue to grow to, to proactively communicate uh, to, to the staff, internal staff, to ensure that we are kind of like communicating as well as tools and applications are concerned. And finally, the goals. Uh, we need to modernize our infrastructure uh, to ensure that we are better prepared to modernize our tools and applications. I think that's very, very critical. Uh, as we onboard new technology members as part of the new organization structure, and as we continue to refine our, and define new processes, we anticipate that our service ticket completion time will reduce dramatically. That's one of our goals, to ensure that we have good end user experience from a customer standpoint. Uh, I'm going to kind of like talk about budget optimization opportunities. This is something like it's 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 in my DNA. It's going to be in the team's DNA in terms of like how we are going to be uh, looking at budget on a daily basis. As part of the new organization structure, we created a dedicated training team uh, to ensure that we provide technical training uh, for students or for uh, for staff, which is basically teacher, campus, and staff, to ensure that they understand clearly what tools and applications we have within our Fort Worth ISD end-to-end uh, -end platform. And finally, strategic goals. Uh, strategic goals for technology through a collaborative uh, committee of cross-functional leaders. And this is very, very important because what we implement should be open and transparent. I think that's very, very important and which should be agreed by the rest of the leaders. So that's what like, we want to ensure that what we are defining as a technology priorities is clearly understood by the rest of the leaders, the rest of the organization, so that there's an open and transparent communication in terms of what technology is working. Uh, I'm going to end this presentation uh, with the following code before I can answer any questions. Uh, I read this a couple of months ago when you kind of like change limitations to opportunities, everything changes. And we have plenty of opportunities over here within the technology organization. So I'm extremely excited as far as the future is concerned. We have a great foundation. Uh, we have plenty of work to do, but I'm absolutely excited as far as the future is concerned. So with that, I'll open the platform for any questions. Trustee Bridges. Yeah. First, thank you for your uh, presentation. 
my, my first question, I'd be kind of curious, have we looked at, I'm curious to know where are we at when it comes to Mac versus Chromebooks in terms of are we seeing, because I know one of the selling, point was, selling points was that the Macs, they, we don't have as much problem, they, they, they last longer. Where, where are we at with that? So we, we are internally kind of like working with our academic partners to redefine the entire student profiles. Yes. And with our internal evaluation, unfortunately it was not implemented the right way. So what we did is like we took a step back and we worked with our academic partners to kind of like clearly define what, what does an elementary student profile should look like? What does a middle student, middle uh, uh, school uh, student should look like? And what are the high schools, right? So working right now, we are kind of like redoing the entire work. We are testing right now and we are going to deploy that. Yes, I'm going to acknowledge over here, we have some issues as far as the student profiles are concerned. Personally, I've been using Mac since 1997. So uh, Apple is a strong product. And in fact, we met Apple a couple of weeks ago to kind of like express our concerns in terms of how it was implemented. So we are working behind the scenes to ensure that we are doing the right thing. So to answer your question, to summarize over here, uh, I don't think the conversation should be Mac or Chromebooks. The conversation should be does the student have the right platform where they can be successful? Yeah. And I think it's going to be our responsibility to ensure that we are providing the right platform. Okay. <laughs> Trustee Dar. Thank you, President Rodriguez, and thank you for this report. It's very thorough. I appreciate your attention to goals and structure and customer satisfaction. In fact, I will call this refreshing. Thank you. And something that I feel has been much needed in our technology department. So thank you for bringing this to the board. Um, and I also love your that limitations are actually opportunities. I've, I have planted that. I'm, that's going to come back up at some point. Probably not from this day, but in my life, it's going to come back up. Um, a quick question on um, slide 14 where it talks about your redesigning organization structure, reducing operating expenses, always always welcome, and increasing direct customer level support. How are you measuring customer satisfaction? So we do not measure currently. Uh, that's something we are implementing currently in the process of implementing a new ticketing system. And as part of the new ticketing system, we have clearly defined SLAs, which is basically service level agreements. So we are going to kind of like clearly define what is a priority one issue. We have kind of like broken this down into P1 to P4, and every priority is going to have an SLA associated with it that we have got to fix a particular issue with a certain period of time. So we are going to be measuring in the future once we have a new ticketing system in place. Right now, we do not have a system in place, unfortunately. I appreciate your honesty. Yeah. And I also appreciate your intent to get a system in place. So that's, that's good news. That's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Lynch. Uh, thank you for the report. Very helpful to understand some of the changes that have been made and uh, kind of where the direction we're going. Um, my curiosity was around kind of our strengths and, and student opportunities. Um, and one of the things I see out there is um, AI, um, cybersecurity, and, and a lot of job opportunities in those spaces. Is there any uh, discussion or idea around getting kids in the district involved with some of those type things um, within the IT department? So I've I'm always been a big believer that like whenever you talk about modernization, whenever you talk about technology, you need to have the right foundation in place. Uh, you cannot kind of like introduce technology on a weak foundation. Uh, probably like you may fail multiple times. So it's very, very important to kind of like have the right foundation place. To your specific question, as far as AI is concerned, we have to kind of like discuss internally with my academic partners in terms of like what are the, what are the goals as far as students are concerned, bringing AI, introducing AI. Again, this goes back to my earlier point. Uh, I don't think it's what 
I need to implement, it's like what we need to implement, right? So we've got to kind of like work with our academic partners to ensure what is the problem area, how do you want to solve that problem area, and we are here to kind of like provide solutions to that. Okay, all right, thank you very much, appreciate thank it. Thank you. Trustee Jackson. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Thank you, uh, as Trustee Dar said, this is quite refreshing. I'd just like to wrap my hands around three things. We've had a reorg, and the first thing is the cost savings. The second thing is eliminating redundant positions, and I presume beefing up areas that you felt were weak. And then the third, streamlining business operations. Could you just elaborate a little bit on that where I could have a one, two, three? So, like, as far as kind of like reducing operating expenses are concerned, like, we made sure that we we introduce more people on the ground. Like when I talk about flatline organization, we want to ensure that a flatline organization is like more people on the ground rather than more people on the top. So that's the way we kind of like reduce our operating expenses. Uh, the, the second question in terms of, um, could you repeat your second and the third question? Sorry about that. I bet I can in just a second. I wanna make sure I give it to you in the right way. So, um, uh, Work output, cost savings, okay, and then eliminating redundant positions. Correct. So, as far as cost savings are concerned, uh, when we looked our at our internal tools, when we looked at our internal applications, we found redundant applications. So that's where the cost savings came into picture. Like, if I kind of like give you an example, like if if I'm using Microsoft Word and I'm having the same application on Google. So I'm kind of like, that's a redundant application. So we kind of like eliminated that, like to ensure that we are using one tool, one application across within technology, that's not impacting our students at all. So that's where the cost savings came into picture. Uh, and as far as redundant redundancy from, from people standpoint, this goes back to that organization structure, right? Like where we identified certain gaps in our organization, which is basically whether I call it as uh, security, which is cybersecurity, there was a huge gap that we identified. Another gap that we identified was enterprise architect. And what, what enterprise architect means is, if I have to kind of like give you an example, whenever you build a new house, you need an architect even before you start building a house. Same thing is with technology. Whenever you build something, you need an architect. It's a technology architect. It's the same concept. You've got to ensure that you're designing and documenting the end-to-end -end solution before you implement the solution. So those are the kind of like gaps that we identify to ensure that we eliminate all the redundant positions and we have the right positions in place. Great, thank you. Trustee Lewebanos. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Uh, thank you for this report. Uh, I just have a couple of questions. Uh, on slide 16, you mentioned a reduced service ticket completion time. Uh, what is the average right now that we have before somebody, you know, by the time they submit a ticket, how long it takes for that to be fixed? Uh, I don't have the I don't have the numbers right now, uh, but. Uh, but I can kind of like get back with you as far as numbers are concerned, but it's not according to our expectations. It's not industry standards, I can tell you that. But to give you the exact numbers, I don't want to kind of like give you incorrect numbers, but I can kind of like get back to the board in terms of like what the average time is. And also if you, you know, as a goal, what would be the average coming back for, you know, if you know, it takes, I don't know, five days or, I'll give, you, I'll, I'll give you a great example, right? Like last Thursday, we had a wireless network issue where we had a district-wide network issue. It was resolved in 30 minutes. According to me, that's a P1 issue. You have an incident across the district and we kind of like got the team together and resolved in 30 minutes. That's the expectations as far as like, when you talk about a P1 issue, a district-wide issue, you want to kind of like get all hands on and fix that issue. So that's the expectation. I can also kind of like send you what we defined internally, what a P1 ticket is, what the expectations are. If the board wants to look at it, we would be more than happy to provide that information. Thank you. And then on the slide 12 on the, on the chart, uh, Based on this, are we going to have enough personnel in order to serve all the campuses? Yes, that's the goal. The, the goal is like, uh, 
the goal is to reduce the number of tickets. That's the ultimate goal, right? Like when we talk about not just from a people standpoint, we could also look at our internal processes. We could also in, uh, ensure that we are simplifying the process. I think the end goal is we've got to simplify our process. The question about Apple devices, right? Like we should not be having this many problems so that we reduce the amount of tickets. So yes, the absolute goal is to ensure that our support tickets are reduced dramatically to what we have today. Uh, am I going to sit over here and say that we'll have no issues? No, we will have issues. Technology will have issues, but we want to kind of like limit that to ensure that we are efficient and we kind of like provide the best platform and infrastructure for all our campus. And last question, how well are we enforcing our policies when somebody breaks a computer and there's a fee for it to, to either replace it or to fix it? How well are we enforcing those policies? We are reworking on the entire process. Like as far as, uh, if I have to kind of like take a step back uh, to clearly understand the responsibility between uh, technology and campus and even parents, right? Like we've got to kind of like clearly outline the processes in place. And if I have to kind of like give you an example over here, what is, what is the campus responsibility when we kind of like provide the devices? What is the student responsibility? What are the parents' responsibility? At the end of the day, this is an academic device that is going home. Parents have got certain responsibilities. So we are kind of like redefining and closely working with our academic partners to clearly define the expectations to ensure that it's standardized across the district. So that's unfortunately work in progress right now uh, because the previous process was not standardized. And you mentioned parents. Are we working on informing parents if you shower breaks a computer the first time, I don't know, it's whatever the price is, or if they lost the computer, are we informing the parents of their responsibilities right now, or are we going to do that for next year? Uh, we are right now currently working. We hope to kind of like have the initial draft by end of this month. And we are going to kind of like work internally. My goal is to kind of like introduce this year. Uh, once we get the necessary approvals, I don't want to wait until next academic year because we need to ensure that we protect our assets and devices are our assets. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Martinez. Thank you for this very comprehensive report. I'm looking at slide 15, works in progress. I'm looking specifically at the um, private LTE to ensure equitable internet access for students. What current gaps have been identified and what does that look like? Uh, like, I did not quite understand the question in terms of gaps. Could you say that one more time? Yeah, one of your works in progress is deploying private LTE to ensure equitable internet access mm -hmm. for students. What, I guess, what gaps have we found that are inequitable and what does that currently look like? So we kind of like, the private LTE is all about like providing a device to student that they can take home and it's going to be free internet access for that particular student. Uh, all the Apple devices, the Mac devices will connect to that private LTE, only student devices will be connected to that private LTE. So you're kind of like providing free home internet for that student so that they can kind of like uh, continue that academic excellence back at home. So we are working closely with our uh, campuses to identify those students who do not have internet access at home or who do not have good internet access at home to ensure that we can kind of like provide that solution. So that's something right now pilot is going on. Right now we are working with like 27 students across the district to kind of like execute that pilot. Once that pilot is successful, then we can kind of like go uh, district wide. And what about the um, connectivity across our campuses? What does, or do we have any gaps in that area? And how are we addressing? Uh, we, we do have gaps. Our infrastructure is old. Uh, it is like eight plus years old. And that's part of my uh, recommendation going into 24, 25 budget. This goes back to my earlier point. We are clearly defining a multi-year strategy in terms of like how do we modernize our infrastructure and how do we also kind of like proactively plan as far as devices are concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Lewebenos. Sorry, one last question. Absolutely. Um, 
for the many MacBooks that we have, are we fixing them or are we sending them back to the to Apple to get them fixed? Depending on or depends on the issue. So we are working very very close closely with Apple uh, to fix it. This goes back to, to your question about process, right? Like in terms of are we kind of like implementing a standardized process? So this is where uh, we need to kind of like clearly define a process in place between campus, uh, technology, and, and parents to ensure that we are protecting our assets. But we are working closely with Apple to kind of like fix, fix those devices. So we, are, so we don't fix them in-house, we send them- No, we do not have the talent. And like Apple is uh, extremely uh, protective as far as devices are concerned. If we open it, we'll void the warranty. So we do not have the in-house talent to kind of like fix those devices. For how long is that warranty that we have? So we have Apple Care for majority of our devices, not 100% of our devices. So within that Apple Care system, we kind of like work closely with our Apple partners to fix it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank Mr. Krishnamurti, and now we have our athletics presentation, Dr. Ramsey. Thank you, I'd like to bring up our Executive Director of Athletics, Jimmy Calderon, who will be providing an update on the athletic program in Fort Worth ISD. All right, thank you. Uh, good evening, President Rodriguez, Dr. Ramsey, and trustees. My name is JJ Calderon, Executive Director of Athletics. Uh, pleased to be here today to share with you some insight on our athletic programs uh, in Fort Worth ISD. I'm uh, gonna talk a little bit, gonna highlight some areas uh, where we've had some success and achievements over the fall and, and winter seasons. Um, talk a little bit about UIL realignment and how that impacts uh, Fort Worth ISD. Uh, and then uh, pinpoint some areas where we've uh, started some uh, projects and then just identify some focus points moving forward for, uh, for next year. Okay, um, starting off with our Seasons, uh, our, our fall season, uh, we had a fantastic cross country season. Uh, started at the regional cross country meet in, in Grand Prairie, which was pouring rain. And uh, we were able to qualify three cross country runners uh, to the state meet in Austin. Uh, we had Jason Dodd representing 5A in South Hills High School, Carly Crouch from Brent Brook Middle, which I believe she's a sophomore, and uh, the famous uh, Angel Sanchez uh, defended his state championship, winning his second gold medal at the state meet in the 4A level from Diamond Hill Jarvis. And I'm looking forward to seeing how he does in, in track this season as well. Uh, moving on to volleyball, uh, we had six teams in volleyball qualify for the playoffs. Uh, ben Brook was our 4A district champions, and Arlington Heights was our 5A district champions. In football, we had five teams qualify for the playoffs. Uh, in Division Two and 4A, Ben Brook uh, represented Fort Worth ISD. Dunbar finished the season strong with a second place finish in 4A Division One, in which also Coach Lawson, the head football coach, won, got his 100th victory uh, this season. So we're, we're proud of him and happy for him. Uh, Arlington Heights was third and had a very good playoff game versus Lake Dallas in the first round. So uh, happy with our playoff <laughs> football teams. Uh, basketball season was exciting. Uh, it's with our girls. We'll start with our girls basketball champions. Uh, Fort Worth Dunbar with uh, Coach Isaac and her group had an amazing season, uh, winning an area championship, a district championship as well. And uh, they had two really exciting playoff games and just came up short in their third game. Uh, Arlington Heights was also the 5A district champs undefeated. Uh, had a good district by district game. Uh, they beat Azel in the by district round and they had a real good season with Coach Saunders and her group. Uh, boys basketball season was also exciting. Again, uh, for, uh, Dunbar High School was our bi-district champions and runner-ups in 4A. And then Eastern Hills, our, our exciting Eastern Hills boys uh, won two playoff games. They were the undefeated district champs. And, and for the most part of the season, they were ranked in the top five in the state. So we're really proud of them. Good thing about them is uh, they, will, they are not graduating any seniors, so their entire team will be back, and we're excited for them. All right, so our district champs as well in 5A, again, was Arlington Heights. So really good basketball season. We're, we're proud of those teams as well. Our wrestling, our wrestling season wrapped up with the state meet in late January. Uh, started at the state meet. 
uh, on to from, I mean, excuse me, from, it started with our district meet and we had 29 regional qualifiers in 4A and 5A. Uh, from our regional, regional tournament, our regional meet, we had six state qualifiers and our highest uh, finishing wrestler was a, a second place uh, finish from uh, Elizabeth Dyer from Pasco High School in the 132 pound weight class. And for going from your district, I just wanna brag on her a little bit. She's going from, our, from a district meet to a regional meet to a state to a state meet is a lot of wrestling and it's, it's really grueling. So kudos to her. She did a great job in, in about a span of five weeks uh, of wrestling. So uh, congratulations to her. Uh, our swimming seasons were successful. Uh, in 4A, 5A, we had district champs in boys and girls. Uh, really proud of our 6A district champs. Our girls from Pasco were district champs. Our boys were also regional qualifiers uh, at the 6A level. Uh, from our regional meet, we had a state qualifier, in the, in, in individual state qualifier in Grant Chapa from Pasco High School. Uh, he ended up eighth place in the 100 meter back and 11th place in the 100 meter butterfly. So really good. And I'll talk about him a little bit later as well. All right, so that, that wraps up our fall and, and winter seasons. We have uh, uh, a few sports still going. So we are uh, finishing up soccer season, about two weeks left in soccer season. We have some really strong soccer teams going and we're looking for, for them to make some strong play, playoff appearances. Uh, golf and tennis is in full go. Uh, our baseball and softball seasons are wrapping up their tournament seasons. Uh, by the way, we, have a, we host a, the Drew Medford tournament baseball tournament coming up this weekend. Uh, 25 baseball teams uh, will be playing at Pasco and Arlington Heights. So a uh, really big game, 6.30 on Saturday. Pasco and, and Arlington Heights should be a lot of fun if you have some time to get out there. Uh, and then we're hosting our track, our district and area track meets the first week of April and the second week of April um, at Clark Stadium. So looking forward to those, those events. Flag football started this week as well. Okay, really, really, uh, uh, something I really want to acknowledge, and I'm really happy to see our student athletes moving on to the next level to play uh, college sports. We had 35, well, February, the first week of February is National Signing Day. Uh, we had a couple of early signings, um, but we were able to uh, have 35 Fort Worth ISD athletes commit to play at the college level. Um, some of the ones that are pictured, we had Jamar Muhammad from Carter Riverside signing a Division I football scholarship for Lamar. Uh, Grant Chapa, who I mentioned earlier, will be swimming at BYU. And Malik Franklin from O.D. Wyatt will be running track at uh, Arizona State. So uh, uh, really proud of those athletes for their uh, dedication and um, opportunities to move on to the college ranks. Okay, um, UIL realignment. Um, as you know, UIL realigns and reclassifies schools every, every other year. Um, February, the... Uh, second week of February, we got the realignment for the 24, 25, 25, 26 school years. And there's a few, few changes for Fort Worth ISD. I'll start with the smaller classifications in 3A. Our young men's leadership and young women's leadership academies will now be competing at the 3A level in Region 2 for basketball and volleyball. Uh, UIL releases football, basketball, and volleyball. Uh, at this time, and they'll release the spring sports a little bit later for as far as realignment goes. For basketball and volleyball, uh, in the 4A and 5A uh, districts, we have seven teams in 5A from Fort Worth ISD. Southwest is new to 4A. They've been reclassified into the 4A division, and we have seven Fort Worth ISD schools in the 5A uh, district, um, with Pascal also new to 5A uh, this coming two years. As far as football goes for 4A, there are two divisions. In Division II, Dunbar will be competing with Benbrook, along with Glen Rose, Godley, Hillsborough, and Venus for district football. And then in Region I, we have our five schools, uh, including Southwest, uh, competing with Decatur and Springtown in football. 5A is a little bit different. 5A Division I, we have, again, we have Pasco uh, now in 5A with uh, seven of our other Fort Worth ISD schools competing against uh, two Eagle Mountain Saginaw schools in Chisholm Trail and Saginaw. We've been working on our football schedules for next year. We've got some really exciting matchups. I know just to mention Southwest will be playing uh, a state champion in Anna, 
So we're, we're excited about those, those uh, games on our schedule and our, uh, there's really good matchups uh, for next year as we host about 70, 65 plus football games every year. So, all right, moving on, uh, talking about improving student experiences, uh, some projects that we have going on. Our video boards and marquees at Farrington, Clark, and Scarborough are probably about 80% complete. Um, we're trying, we're probably in the test phase right now. Um, the boards are up. Uh, the little bit of the design phases, or the Fort Worth ISD, the logos and those kind of things are going up. Um, so we'll be running tests for audio and video probably this coming week and have those hopefully completed by our district meet the first week of April. And then again, thankful for the approval of our, um, the board approving our new uh, resurfacing of our tracks and our turf fields at Northside, Eastern Hills and Polytech and the track at South Hills High School. Uh, we've started talking about those projects and we're looking at a window of probably April, first week of April, uh, all the way through uh, the end of July. So having those ready for, for, uh, for the 24-25 uh, school year. Okay, another project that we're working on and identified is we, we want to help develop our coaches and provide them uh, with the resources they need to grow and, uh, and help with their teams. Uh, before I, I, I talk about that, I want to I uh, uh, recognize one of our new coaches. Uh, we had a uh, coach from Carter Riverside High School, athletic coordinator, joined us in the athletic office, and we, which created a vacancy, and we hired Dustin Pleasant, came to us from Leander Rouse. He's about a month on the job as the athletic coordinator, head football coach at Carter Riverside, and he's doing a great job. And it's not easy to replace somebody mid-year, and uh, I think our district did a great job in getting him in and getting him uh, acquainted with uh, his new school pretty quickly. So um, he's off to a good start and he's doing some really good things there. Uh, as far as staff development opportunities for our coaches, uh, last uh, two weeks ago, we took 30 of our athletic coordinators to a THSCA leadership summit in Arlington. Uh, that was a great experience for them. We wanna continue those type of activities to help uh, grow our coaches. Uh, we are starting, uh, we are joining Seat at the Table, which is a statewide, um, just to support opportunities for our female coaches to fellowship and um, visit with other coaches across the state, uh, just to discuss uh, ways for improvement and, and give our coaches an opportunity to visit with um, neighboring districts and, and other districts across the state. Uh, one thing that we're really proud of, uh, the Texas High School Coaches Association um, initiated our, what's called a Rock Mentoring Program in which they take nominations for first and second year coaches. Uh, they bring them in so, sort of like a retreat. They put them through um, quite a few um, scenarios to help them grow as coaches and professionally. Uh, we nominated a coach from Pasco High School and we were pleased to have him um, selected as one of the Rock mentees. And Orlando Carrillo was actually, the last two days has gone through this process and we're really, uh, we're really you know, proud that he has gone through this and he was selected for this. It's not, not everybody gets selected and, it, and he was, uh, again, uh, part of this elite group. Okay, just some identify some focus points that we've, identif uh, we've identified moving forward to try and lay, some, lay the groundwork for our programs. Um, I know we talked a lot about our high schools and our varsity programs, but we really want to get to the nuts and bolts of where we're at and how we build programs and that's what the middle schools uh, so we were really looking at opportunities to increase competition opportunities for our middle schools, um, be creative and, and strategic in how we schedule our competitions uh, to help, like I, get, like I said, give opportunities for our student athletes to compete. Uh, we've talked to our athletic coordinators extensively about building vertically aligned programs, reaching out to their pyramids and their feeder schools uh, to provide camps for the middle schools, uh, to have middle school theme nights at the high schools when they have games, uh, to invite those middle school kids up so that they feel like they're a part and that they know there's a plan for them when they get to the high school level. Uh, we've also asked for our athletic coordinators to help with the middle school uh, athletic period structure. So we've identified those areas. Um, we've looked at quite a few character education building programs um, uh, with, that we could bring in to, uh, for our coaches to use as resources to help our student athletes uh, beyond athletics and just help with citizenship and, and building strong uh, strong character within our programs. Uh, we're looking at those programs. Again, we're, we want to make sure we give opportunities for our student athletes to stay connected over the summer months. 
Um, so we're looking at summer programs, we're looking at camps and so forth moving forward. And then again, um, late March, we take a deeper dive and we take some, uh, we look at participation numbers, we take some data and we kind of evaluate how we can plan moving forward for coaching staffs and budget purposes. So uh, we will take a look at what our participation numbers look like moving forward at the end of March. Okay, and what's on deck? Again, we, we just wanna identify ways we can incre increase student participation. Uh, we wanna provide ongoing professional development opportunities for our coaches. Uh, one thing that we've had some feedback from the community on is restructuring ticket, ticketing and game admissions. And then uh, we wanna improve our game day operations, how we're, how we're operating at our central sites and our high schools so that we can be efficient uh, as far as um, being welcoming to our community, concessions, um, bus parking, security, all those things. So we run a, an efficient operation uh, for our games. And then again, we wanna really emphasize uh, taking the next step as far as uh, achieving success uh, in athletics. Okay, all right, with that, I think uh, that's all I have as far as my presentations. What, what questions can, can I answer for you? Trustee Martinez. I'm glad to see the focus on um, middle schools. Um, just as we've experienced teacher shortages, we've seen coaching shortages. How are we addressing these shortages, ensuring that the, all of our campuses have support? Well, one thing that I, what I, um, again, I've been here, I've been, this is my sixth month, um, so I have two months on, on, on Mr. Ramesh, but uh, one thing that I've really been pleased with, and just in comparing with some other districts, is I, I think we have, um, quite a f most of our campuses have complete staffs. I know in the middle school areas we, we are have some gaps, um, but at the high in most of the high schools we have com not if not complete staffs we're pretty close. Um, when it comes to head coaching openings we've had uh, we've been able to fill those spots pretty efficiently. Um, but in moving forward we have identified a, a, a staff structure which allows us to have a baseline for how many coaches we hire and then we can, we can adjust according to participation. Um, so this will probably help um, a little bit with um, filling the gaps with vacancies. Uh, we, would, we do need to take a closer look at our middle schools and how we can assist them with, with coaching staffs because I know there are shortages, shortages in the middle school. And then this might, um, I think you addressed it, it, it is gonna be done at the end of the season. I was curious to know what areas have we seen uh, decreases and increases in participation, but I think you said that would be done at the um, end of March. Correct? Right, and we, we have collected a little bit of data as far as participation numbers go, but it's not uh, really comprehensive across the board. We wanna take a, a deeper dive and take, take a look at what we are per sport um, at the middle school level, at the, at the high school level, ninth through 12th, obviously freshman, JV, those, those levels, and we wanna take a, a, a look at each sport. I haven't seen um, alarming numbers, um, but uh, I know that there's some areas that we can, and some ways we can look at improve, improving participation numbers. In general, I know, like, of course, we COVID, um, you know, impacted our numbers significantly. Have Have you seen in general, like, are we back to pre-COVID number participation? It's, right. It's more It's more of a recovery, like at the middle school level. But um, obviously, there is that lower numbers. I guess probably in our senior groups that we've seen. But usually, the senior group is the lower number anyway. Um, but there's nothing that has been identifiable yet. Um, but we're ready to dig into those numbers when we get them and, and take a look at what, what ways we can improve and what some of the causes are um, so we can address you know, our participation numbers and hopefully make some increases. Thank you. Thank you again for focusing on our middle schools. Yes, ma'am. Trustee Jackson. Thank you, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, thank you for pointing out the girls and boys basketball championships. Uh, for the first time in the history of Eastern Hills, the girls who weren't noted won by district and the young men went all the way to the area championship and it's the first time we've ever had young men and women both excel in basketball to that level. So I just wanted to point that out since they weren't on here. Yes, uh, no offense taken. Got it. Uh, the, the next thing I wanted to ask, and this has always puzzled me, our varsity coaches seem to make the time, but it seems stressful to them to get down to the middle school and the middle school coaches 
don't seem to get up to the varsity level to take their kids to their pyramid high school or go for the pyramid high school, take students down to the middle school. Do you have a plan in place to kind of connect the dots there? Uh, that's a great question. And yes, yes, we do. Um, by the way, the Eastern Hills community support for the playoff basketball was, was amazing. Um, that was, it was fun to watch them. Uh, as far as our, uh, I mentioned our vertical alignment um, with, uh, with our pyramids. Uh, we've, we've started some talks with our athletic coordinators, like I said, about you know, trying to dig into the middle schools, uh, making the time. Um, it's a little bit harder for our head coaches to get down, but um, we want to look at opportunities to do that um, on both sides. Not only go down and see them during their athletic periods, help provide those middle school coaches with structure for their athletic periods, uh, and get involved with making connections with kids. Um, that's what we've started talking about. Uh, we've talked about having camps uh, to get kids also um, in reverse, have the kids come up to the high schools. That way they see, you know, there's a plan for me when I get here. This is what it's going to look like. The coach knows my name, those kind of things to make those connections to help not only us to retain kids, but just to build that community um, and, and sense of pride for those younger athletes to be involved in uh, the high school and the, of their community. Um, looking at other ways, there's, there's other ways as well to make connections. Uh, obviously visiting with the campus administration to see what opportunities are there so we can dive in if there's, you know, whatever it is, fundraising opportunities or opportunities um, that we can all, you know, work with the community. That's, that's something that we want to do. Um, again, um, having games at central sites, um, bringing middle school games to high schools, having high schools practices at middle schools, all those little things are very helpful when it comes to um, building vertical alignment. So we'll start visiting with our coaches about that a little bit, a little bit as, the, as the, air, the year ends out and making it one of our priorities. Great. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Trustee Ryan. Well, first, thank you very much for a, a really nice report. Glad we could do it. Uh, I know that I've been wanting to see this since I started working with the district about 15 Great. years ago, 16 years ago. Glad you got to do it. I appreciate administration making this work out. Hopefully we'll have some other groups be able to come up. I a couple of questions I've got. Uh, I've noticed we lose students between middle school and high school to other districts. And many times it's because they're, those districts have winning teams and they might be coming from someplace that's not, we can't fix that, uh, except to do the work that you're putting in place to make our teams winners. The second thing comes from facilities, and I know that our facilities aren't up to standards if you go to the suburban communities around us. And so hopefully you'll have a plan somewhere in the future about what we need to do everywhere that we can uh, try to improve our facilities for our kids. I, when I go into some of the dressing rooms, uh, you kind of sit there and, and go, I wouldn't want to come in here. There, something might bite me if I, if I stayed in here too long. So we need to fix those things. And I, I look forward to, to seeing what we can do that way. Uh, th third thing I always wondered about was advertising. I see in some of the baseball fields, we've got some signs up that the parents have gone out and sold, but are we working as a district to do advertising that uh, the athletic department gets a, a large share of that uh, funding if they go out and do the work to get that in. I know in the past it had been anything you raise, it all comes into the central coffers just for the district as a whole, but I'd like to see something that, that uh, if you guys go out and do the work and you get support from that, that, that goes into helping our athletes. Great. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly we, um, we have taken a look at you know, retaining our athletes, like you said, um, we are looking for ways and athletics is not any different than anything else. Kids want to be, they want to be wanted. They want to know there's a plan for them. And um, we are, we have visited about opportunities to do that and making it a priority to uh, take care of our kids in our middle schools so that we do, we do retain them and we make them feel like they're a part of our community. So um, we are working on that as far as our facilities go. Um, we are taking a, a closer look at things like locker rooms. Um, we're again, we're again, we're grateful for the opportunity to put new playing surfaces um, on our on our turf fields and our tracks. Um, some other safety items that we've taken a look at. Some some locker rooms, some weight rooms. We'll take a closer look at and see how we can uh, not only maintain but upgrade some areas. So uh, we've identified some re you know replenishing resting mats, those kind of things. We're taking a look at 
um, what our what our priority list will be moving forward for the, for next year. Um, and as far as sponsorships go, um, these the new video boards going up. We've had um, some. Uh, we've had a marketing rep reach out to us. It's part of the video board process. Um, they are in the process of looking at um, sponsorships. Uh, we have quite a few leads. We've got a, not, not really commitments yet, but we've got a lot of opportunities for sponsorships um, for our video boards, for our central site, uh, central site um, uh, venues. Um, as far as uh, other opportunities to generate revenue, we, you know, I've talked to some of our booster clubs. I've met with two of our booster clubs. Um, they have some really good plans and some good ideas that we might want to share with other people as well. So um, I think uh, moving forward, I, I think that there are some opportunities. We haven't got to dive in too much yet uh, on, on sponsorships, but I think there's some opportunities for us moving forward. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, sir. Trustee Lynch. Thank you for sharing. Appreciate it. Uh, I'm glad you're here and uh, appreciate the communication that's gone out around the uh, sports athletics going on. I think it's been very helpful within the community. A couple questions. Uh, you know, excited about realignment and getting a bunch of Fort Worth schools to play, compete against each other on a regular basis. How has that impacted scheduling for you? I know there's some opportunities, but I, you know, you get three football stadiums and everybody's playing each other. So how does how does that work? It actually helps. Um, it, it, we've been able to eliminate a little bit of the Saturday games, and Saturday games are the tough ones. Um, they're just lower, lower attended games, but um, that was one thing that we were happy for football. Um, but overall, um, I, I really feel like UIL, uh, the UIL realignment was, was good for us. Okay. Um, it gives us an opportunity to, um, we were previously, for, for example, for football, we were in five districts. Now we're in three. Um, mm -hmm. We still have the opportunity to play outside of Fort Worth, and we're still playing. We've um, increased our, our playoff opportunities, so we're going to be able to get more schools in the playoffs. Um, so it was really good for us. Scheduling is always going to be difficult. Uh, our coaches do a really good job. Um, it looks like we have complete football schedules, which I can't um, speak for the rest of the area. There's some people that need games, and we were able to fill a complete schedule. We'll start working on volleyball and basketball soon on scheduling, so I'll give it a little bit more feedback. But one thing that we did want, we do want to do as a department, we want to we we want to host more tournaments. Uh, we want to bring people to our tournaments. Um, uh, so we want to look at who can host and what schools would be willing to host. So we're, we're going to look at doing that a little bit more for, for our kids that uh, get to stay uh, on campus and, and, you know, we get to, we get to um, bring other schools in instead of going out every single weekend to tournaments. So we're going to host some more tournaments. Uh, but scheduling hasn't been um, really difficult for us so far, but okay. we've, we've actually, it's, uh, the realignment has actually benefited uh, us when it comes to football schedules anyway. Okay. Awesome. Um, last question. Um, with declining enrollment, you know, oftentimes, you know, we have teacher shortages, but you lose FTEs at different campuses. If you lose a coach um, as well as a FTE, how do, you, how do you solve that puzzle? Well, uh, I can't say I've, I've been able to identify a certain sport or a coach that we, we have lost um, so far. Obviously, it's not the time of year where that takes place. But um, I, I think, you know, from what I've seen, I can just give you an example or – uh, our athletic coordinator head football position at Carter Riverside High School had 50 plus applicants. Um, so I think there are coaches out there that want to coach in Fort Worth ISD. And I think that there's um, some coaches that uh, we can promote, some coaches we can bring from from outside of Fort Worth ISD. But um, I have not run into any um, any direct um, um, coaching areas where, where we've not been able to fill a coaching position yet. OK. And then. Um what, what can the board do to support you? Well, um, good question. We're looking at, you know, we're looking at areas where we can, we can uh, um, improve or we can uh, uh, upgrade as far as facilities. Uh, obviously, our kids, um, our kids are, you know, involved in, in so much and there's uh, more than just venues. But our, um, we are, like I said, that's why I put our, um, our opportunities up there. Um, I think um, just like I said, overall support There's really not anything we can pinpoint right now, but we'll take a closer look at the end of the year um, to see, you know, what we can do to uh, increase participation. That's that's our number one goal. And just to give our kids a, a great experience when they 
uh, compete uh, for Fort Worth ISD and our teams. Uh, we want to give them a sense of pride of com competing for their community and um, just get community support. So just um, just building up athletics as a whole. Uh, we've taken quite a few steps forward and we're looking to um, take a few more next year. But thank you for, for, uh, for asking. Trustee Loebanos. Thank you. Thank you for this report. <clears throat> thank you for being here. And uh, I noticed you have the knowledge of the students and you know, you, you know them by heart by now, uh, some of the students. So thank you for that. Uh, what can we do better or how can we improve our concession stands when people are, you know, they take forever to, to provide better customer service to the parents who you know, are at Farrington Field. It takes 20 minutes to get a popcorn and a, a bottle of water. Uh, what can we do better to improve that experience for our community? Well, uh, again, we, we've, one of our goals is to improve the game day operations. Um, everything from concessions to um, restrooms to parking to buses. Uh, we're going to take a, a look at that and, and, and revamp a little bit what we're doing. Um, obviously, long lines are, are, are difficult. You know, there's only one row of front row parking. And, there, you know, and uh, uh, we've, as far as what you're talking about, concessions, we've looked at some uh, possibilities of, of bringing in some you know, outside organizations and give opportunities for booster clubs to sell more concessions possibly food trucks, those kind of things. We're, we're, we're open to looking at making some changes in those areas. Um, again, in, in our central side areas, um, we, do have, um, we do have quite a few workers that, that, that help us as far as um, game day operations, um, but just be a little bit more detailed and, and helpful and to provide customer service. Um, we wanna make a great, want make our events you know, for our community. We want to make a, a bigger sense of community and just create that great big game day ambiance for our, for our fans. So um, we're looking at that. We're hoping to improve, like I said, our game day operations and it's step-by-step -step process. Um, there's not one thing that we identify, but, you know, we want more people out of games and we want people to enjoy uh, supporting their community. Thank you. Trustee Phillips. Thank you, President Rodriguez. Just a question yes, surrounding... Uh, the UIL alignment. So I know that at one point, the Young Men's Leadership Academy had football, and, and it was some discrepancies, probably UIL or whatever, with where they would be placed. Correct. Uh, it was a successful pro football program at one point, but now it seems that Young Men's Leadership Academy is moving to a different division, down to 3A, it looks Correct. like. So how does that, how does that uh, work as far as the conversation around if football would be possible for Young Men's Leadership Academy again with a new alignment. Um, right, and to be, to be um, transparent with you, we, we have taken a close look at the possibility of it. Um, right now, just I don't, I'm not sure that the campus has the capacity to go into a football season. Um, there's some um, football fields, um, some practice areas that we would probably have to you know, take a closer look at before we committed to doing something like that. Um, taking a close look at uh, numbers, um, maybe survey, see who's interested. If it's if it's something that we need to do moving forward, um, but right now, I, um, just looking at the school and visiting with them, um, there were some concerns moving forward. We need to probably have better answers for some of the questions before we take a look at um, moving forward with providing uh, football for for young men's. Yeah, and I guess more facility type aspect of things when and, it comes to that. And participation, um, just to get some clarification on where we would be, where we would be aligned, who we compete against, where those students would come from, and so forth. Right. Okay. And so and that's a conversation that can be had. Yes. I think it would probably have to be a buildup of uh, multiple conversations, multiple meetings to see if it's, it's something that, um, you know, it's going to be uh, helpful for all moving forward or, you know, something that, you know, we end up in the previous situation. Okay. And I said it from an interest standpoint, yeah. it seems that the interest would be there. Like I said, because the program was successful right. when it was actually running. Right. And I understand circumstances occur, but if circumstances are changing, right. or there's ways to be able to roll with what the new things are, right. it would behoove us to actually look into yes, sir. how could that be beneficial for that campus and for those young men that want to participate in that. Sure. And I'm all for building programs. I love, I love giving kids opportunities. Like I said, it's one of my main goals is to give kids opportunities. So if there's a, a way to build up to that, 
just so we can evaluate step by step. Are we hitting checkpoints? Are we looking at um, making progress? Is it something that's going to be uh, good for our kids, good for our school? I think mean, we can go go for go forward with it. But I think uh, in doing something like that, we probably have to look at um, baseline stages first and build something to build up to. Okay, you know you know what I'm hearing, right? What's that? It's going to take a long time. Got gotcha. <laughs> you. I, I don't want us to take a long time okay. to figure out if we can because if it's not Absolutely. possible, it's not possible. But it sounds like it could be possible. Right. And if it is possible, then the adults have to make it possible. So it would be good for us to actually know real answers about that. Understood. Noted, sir. Appreciate you, man. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Trustee Dar. Thank you, President Rodriguez, and thank you for this report. I've, I'm a firm believer that every student, every adult for that matter too, but every student needs a group that they are a part of that is working toward a common goal. And athletics is certainly one of those areas that um, gives students that opportunity. So that's um, exciting. I'm the mother of three Fort Worth ISD, their former or present athletes, and so I appreciate the work that you're doing. Um, you mentioned sponsorship. Um, I know that as we go to other facilities, there's often lots of sponsorship around the facilities that are there, whether it's on the um, scoreboard or the um, the sides of the stadium, whatever. Is there a specific process that's been put in place or already in place that uh, for a sponsor, if somebody wants to sponsor at an athletic facility in Fort Worth? Um, I don't have a answer for you on that. I'm not sure. I, I think we talked about the example of the outfield fences in some of our st of our areas of our I'm sorry of our of our baseball fields and softball fields. Um, we are taking a closer look at that stuff. I'm not sure if it's booster club driven. Um, haven't had the op the time yet to get into that sponsorships. I know we barely started uh, visiting with uh, our our scoreboard <clears throat> vendor, um, uh, our video board vendor, um, and they have provided, like I said, a marketing agent that's going to help us. Um, identify uh, potential sponsors and um, we are starting to have those meetings um, I've had about two already uh, but I think there's some more opportunities I will ask them you know what they recommend as best process and I'll take a look and see who our specific vendors are sometimes people leave up signs up you know um, over time and I'm, I'm not sure if they're even current so we'll take a closer look at that and maybe I could provide who our sponsors are um, district-wide provide some information to you on that um, as, as a district, as a whole. Yeah, thank you, yes, appreciate that. Trust, Trustee Martinez. Um, I had a couple comments and then an additional question. Um, I heard you say that one, you know, you wanna increase uh, community support. Something that I, I constantly hear out in the community um, and maybe something that we can take a look at when it comes to scheduling and hopefully it'll be better with the realignment. Um, is sending teams that are relatively close together, and I'll give you an example, like uh, Diamond Hill Jarvis and Castleberry, um, to Clark Stadium where they have to go clear across town when they're right down the street from each other. So that's something that I constantly hear from the community. So hopefully that doesn't happen with Springtown and we can um, you know, just try to put those teams in more close proximity and get more community out to those games and those events. So that's something that I constantly hear and the other thing I think that we need to take a good hard look at is, um, you know, for uh, mo many of our sports, we have um, them playing at home at their home campus field. So like uh, soccer and baseball. I think we need to take a good hard look at our our facilities and specifically from a community parent spectator experience, if we have adequate and equitable like restrooms and concession areas, um, I know that that has come up quite a bit. So those are just two things that I constantly hear from the community. And then another thing I'm hoping to see a plan in the future, um, facilities plan also, is how we can address some of the inequities specifically in girls' facilities around locker rooms. I know some of the um, spaces that I've seen have um, shown to be pretty inequitable and hopefully we can address that with future bonds and, f and future plans. And then the quite last qu or question that I had was, Fort Worth has a plethora of youth programs from the YMCA to Optimus Club to North Texas Youth Sports. How can we better work with them to get our high school um, district, you know, brand brands out in front of those youth programs and get them to, to come to our um, athletic programs? Right. Um, 
to start off with, uh, you mentioned Springtown. UIL does some things that make you scratch your head um, with them being in our district. So obviously we, we will take a close look and we are probably about 90% complete with some of those schedules. So we're, we're going to start looking at that and maybe get some feedback from our coaches and our principals as well um, on those schedules. Um, but as far as you know, community and getting kids involved in what you're doing at the high schools and even the middle schools, um, again, just you know, opportunities to get into the elementaries and give camps. Um, camps have always been big for us. We have something that we've stressed so far. Um, but just making it important, making kids important, making their participation important, making them feel valued in their community. Um, those are all, and, and I can say this to you, but, you know, there's got to be an action piece on the campuses. So, um, again, we are looking at, you know, really promoting that, pushing that out as initiatives um, and so that we can get, you know, our kids feel valued in our community. That's huge for me. And, um, again, like I said, there's if there's ideas or ways to, you know, to, um, promote that. We're definitely open to, um, to to supporting those groups in any way we can. Trustee Ryan. I just missed one question that sure. I needed to ask you on the restructuring for ticketing and game admissions. Sure. Are we doing anything so people can come up and pay for tickets and we're not having to pay fees to right. outside people? Well, one of the good things that came out of COVID is the opportunity to do online ticketing and, and the majority of schools across the state and everywhere, and even colleges are doing um, um, strictly online ticketing. Some of those concerns have been brought up as far as being able to pay cash, but uh, more of the, the service fees and those other things we're going to take a closer look at. I think there's some opportunities out there, and I'm glad you asked that question. There's a, um, some opportunities out there to uh, provide our community with season passes, um, to consolidate ticketing to one campus, um, just some op opportunities to avoid having to pay service fees every single time. So we're going to take a closer look at that, see how we can help our community a little bit more because those are some concerns that have been brought up to us. So um, just re not a whole restructure of our ticketing um, um, service provider, but um, just an overall better way to serve our community as far as tickets go. Thank on you. campus and at central sites thank you yes sir okay thank you mr calderon and and thank you trustee martinez about the the fields i had those questions too about going all the way to clark or handley when farrington field is five minutes from Northside high school Got so it. and thank you also dr ryan because i had questions about the tickets and the service fees and i went to the Eastern Hills game and I didn't have a ticket. I was like, oh my goodness, but did it online. So that was good. But my I thank you, Mr. Calderon, for giving us the schedules weekly, sure. but is there any way we can get the entire schedule for all of volleyball, all of football prior to the season so I can plan accordingly? Sure, absolutely. I'd like to attend more games and I mean everything, volleyball, soccer, just every school, across the district would be helpful so I can go because because I represent Trimble Tech and Northside but I'd be a wildcat so understood sure we've built up to that um it's something that we've built up to um we've gotten better at putting schedules out um we've got a good plan moving forward uh kind of a standardized way to to um to schedule and then we'll we're going to do our very best to put them online next year um, so that everybody can see them. The, problem, the issue with that is just accuracy. Sometimes we have changes. We're such a big district. We have changes for a freshman um, volleyball game that we're not made aware of, and we just want to make sure we have accurate information out there. So um, we think we have a good system in place. We'll troubleshoot over the summer, and hopefully we can get um, schedules out to everybody so we can hopefully Im Im increase um, attendance at games as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. And now we're up to the call the public hearing to order, a public hearing to discuss the annual taper report of the 2022-23 Texas Academic Performance Report. Uh, Dr. Ramsey, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Dr. Molinar will be presenting for the district this evening. Thank you, President Rodriguez and Dr. Ramsey and trustees. Um, just a reminder for our stakeholders, this is our required report from the Texas Education Agency that um, does follow our Texas Education Code 39.306. We have to uh, report 
do this TAPER report. We call it TAPER. It's the Texas Academic Performance Report. It's otherwise known as TAPER. We have to do this within 90 days after it, after it is released to the public. You'll see here on this page that um, as you're looking for our TAPER report, the academic performance report, you can search that by our district name or by our district number. Many people don't know our district number. That's more for accountability purposes. However, those of us who live in accountability world, we um, have this by heart. So you'll also see here that we do not have a rating for our accountability as well as our special education um, status. And that is because we still are in the middle of a pending lawsuit um, with the Texas Education Ag Agency with the commissioner. So we are not rated um, for the 22-23 school year at this time. And I failed to remind everyone, all of our stakeholders at home, that this taper report is from the 22-23 school year. So this is lagging data that we report on every year. You'll see here there's two different ways you can find the taper report. This is a very robust report. It is um, very large. So we do recommend that you do not print it out unless you really want to, but um, visit it online. The Texas Education Agency under um, their um, academic reporting and their performance reports, you'll find a tab or you'll see that search button that's at the top right hand corner of the TEA website that you can just type in taper and all the taper reports for all the prior years will be listed. And then that's when you would go back and you could search by our district name or our district number that we showed you on slide two. We also will be posting this report on our webpage, Fort Worth ISD webpage, for you to be able to assess, um, make that accessible to you quickly. So there are indicators that you'll find in our taper report. Um, of course, one of them is if we're accredited um, public school system, which we are for 22-23. Um, that link is a link that is internal link that if you wanna read up on that accreditation, you can. Our financial actual report for 21-22. Um, so this is a two year lagging data because the financial report is not reporting to the spring. So you'll see that all of the data with that link that's associated to the associated with the financial report is for our 21-22 school year. Also, our campus perform performance objectives you will find. And many of you trustees have looked at our campus improvement plans that you approved by our campuses in October, and you'll find all of their goals and metrics that are aligned with, of course, our district goals as well. Another indicator are our reports on violent and criminal incidents. I wanted to take a moment to really lift out um, violent. That is an indicator that the state uses. It does cause sometimes a pause when we talk about incidents that are violent. Um, I wanted to point out that we lifted out um, felony reports. And I just wanna do a quick reminder to our stakeholders that um, felonies are decided with, of course, our Fort Worth um, PD, our police, our agency, as well as law, that we do not decide what is a felony incident. Some of those incidents do occur off campus that do not involve the school at all. However, it is if a, a student is charged with a felony, then we follow our student code of conduct, which is aligned, of course, with the, um, the state um, the state requirements, and then we have to report that incident as a felony. You'll also see that we have controlled substance violations reported there, and all of those things um, fall into that indicator of a 22-23 report of violent or criminal. And you'll also see that we have our policies around school safety that really focus on our students, and of course our student code of conduct, which you can find on our parent page as well as our student page. And then here's our last indicator we want to share. And just as a quick reminder, um, this is our lagging data. So when we look at our high school graduates, this is from our 2021 school year of our seniors that we track to see where our seniors from that 2021 school year end up as um, after high school graduation. It is a little different in Texas because they ha if they enter a Texas public school, we're able to track them due to a unique student ID number. However, you'll see that we do have some criteria there where we have some not trackable 
That means that wherever they have enrolled, they have a different student ID number that we're not able to track. And then we do have 2,266 students from that cohort that we know moved on to um, a different type of higher ed situation. However, um, we're not able to track them. They could have gone to a um, four-year school or two-year school that's outside of Texas or that does not report this data to us. So we do our best, but this is also um, not only a one-year lagging data, but a two-year. And then we are dependent on with the student enrolling, giving information on which uh, course high school or district that they graduate from, and then if we're able to track their number. And we do that in the fall of the following year from the seniors um, from graduating. So at this time, this completes our public hearing for our taper report and open up to any questions. All right, there are Thank no you. questions. Thank you, Dr. Molinar. At this time, we have no public comment. So the time is 6.50. Oh. oh. Sorry. At, thank you. The public hearing is now closed. No speakers. And the time is 6.51 p.m. The date is Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. We will now recess and reconvene for executive session as authorized by Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, other sections 551.071, 072, 074, and 076.
your space. In accordance with the open meetings law, the board opened the meeting at 5.30 p.m. with the quorum present, recessed and reconvened open session, adjourned regular session, convened executive session, adjourned executive session, and now reconvened open session at 9.12 p.m. with the quorum present. Now on to action items, personnel, for 7A1, Executive Director of IT Infrastructure. We take <coughs> together? Oh, please. And Executive Director of IT Platforms. Do I have a motion for the personnel recommendation discussed in executive session? So moved. Trustee Jackson, do I have a second? Second. Trustee Ryan, any discussion? Please move the voting. This is for 7A1. 7A, A1 and A2, we're taking them both. Both at the same time, okay. We're missing one. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Dr. Ramsey, would you like to introduce the new personnel? Uh, thank you. Both of uh, the new executive directors that were appointed this evening are existing employees in the district, so they were both promoted into their positions. So I want to congratulate the executive director of IT infrastructure, Laura Matthews, and the executive director of IT platforms, Glenn Ryan. Congratulations to them both. Okay, the time is 9.14 p.m. and this meeting is adjourned.